and welcome. I hope you had a meaningful, inspirational holiday season. And now we go back to embracing a new year with passion and courage. Tonight's class is dedicated by the Solomon and Teitelbaum family in honor of the 40th birthday of Rabbi Mendy Solomon the Chabad ambassador to Short Hills, New Jersey, for a year of abundant health, happiness, and prosperity. It's also dedicated by our dear friends, David and Ida Schattenstein, in the sacred memory of Rabbi Gavriel Noyach and Rifki Holzberg and all of the Mumbai Kedoshim, and also in occasion of the first yard site of a young soul, Alta Shula, Swerdlov, the daughter of Rabbi Yossi and Hindel Swordlove, who was killed in a uh, car accident one year ago in the holy city of Jerusalem. May their memory be a blessing and an inspiration to all of us. Why was Noah not chosen to be the first Jew? After all, he was the individual who saved civilization after a devastating flood, and yet it was Avram Avinu Abraham, not Noah, chosen to become the founder of Judaism. Why not Noah? Open up source number one in your curriculum. Right below the video, there is a PDF. The Torah opens up the weekly portion of Noah. Ela told us Noah, this is the narrative, this is the family of Noah. Noah is tzaddik, tomim hoya b'dayreisov. Noah was a righteous person, a wholesome person in his generation. As ha'alakim is ha'alach Noah, Noah walked with God. The Torah itself testifies about Noah, that he was a tzaddik, that he was a tomim, he was a wholesome and righteous person in his generation. And yet... Despite this extraordinary testimony, he is not chosen to be the first Jew. Now take a look at source number two, Rashi's interpretation. Rashi, the most basic biblical commentator, his interpretation to the opening verse of Noah. Rashi quotes the word Bidoyreisov. He was a tzaddik in his generation. Yesh, mi rabbi seinu, source number two. Yesh, mi rabbi seinu, der some of our rabbis expound this word to imply the praise of Noach. If in his generation he was righteous, certainly. If he would have been living in a more righteous generation, in a generation of greater people, of more morality and justice, he would have been even a greater tzaddik. But there are those who expound the verse in his generation to imply the disgrace of Noach. Relative to his generation, morally corrupt and depraved, a generation that deserved to be destroyed because of its complete moral degeneration to the point that a world, the earth, was in, could not be salvaged, cannot be redeemed. Relative to his corrupt generation, he was righteous. But if he would have lived in the generation of Abraham, he would have been considered anything. He would amount to nothing. 
So when the Torah says, B'dayro Yisav, he was a tzaddik in his generation, it can be interpreted two ways. It's saying, even in his generation he was a tzaddik, certainly in another generation, ha, he would have been so great, because the environment would have been helpful. Or others interpret it exactly the opposite. But the Yerusha, in his generation, he was righteous. In Abraham's generation, he would amount to nothing. Relative, relative to the people around him, he was a tzaddik. It reminds me, of course, it's a far-fetched reminder, but it's a cute anecdote. There was once a Jew who died, and uh, he had his funeral, and the custom in that community was that they would not bury anybody without a eulogy. The problem is that this person who died had a terrible reputation. Everybody despised him and loathed him. And he was a thief and a liar and despicable degenerate. So it comes time for the funeral and the eulogies and no one gets up to eulogize this person. No one has anything good to say. They wait for 10 minutes and a half an hour and an hour and finally the rabbi of the community stands up and he says, listen rabbi, say my dear friends, we have an old custom in this community, nobody gets buried without a eulogy, so unless you want to sit here for a week or two weeks, we will not continue with the funeral procession and go to the cemetery if nobody gets up to say something nice. Nobody has anything to say. The rabbi says, Mamish, no one has anything to say. Finally, there's an old man, a 90-year-old man sitting in the back row. He raises his hand, I'll ha- I have something to say. It's nice, yes. The man gets up and he says, his brother was worse. So, B'doyroi <laughs> Sov, relative to his generation, he was righteous. Relative to his brothers, he was a great man. But relative to another generation, it amounts to nothing. Now, the obvious question is, if you have an opportunity to explain something positively, why choose a negative interpretation? Concerning any person, there's the famous mission in the ethics of our fathers, chapter 1, judge every person meritoriously. If you can give a person the benefit of the doubt, if you can attribute positive motives to his or her actions, do it. Especially in this case when we're dealing not just with a regular person, but a man like Noah, who is saved from an entire earth, from an entire generation. He and his family are the only ones saved. God speaks to him. Torah says he's a tzaddik. Some of the rabbis interpret it positively to bring out the greatness of Noah. Why choose a negative interpretation, even if you can? Hold this in your mind for a moment. Of course, there's one city that always holds, has a great place in all of our hearts. It's the city of Yerushalayim of Jerusalem. The city of Jerusalem is central to Jewish consciousness, to Jewish history. And as always, Jerusalem is in the news yet once again. But what is the origin of the name Yerushalayim? Who gave it first its name, Jerusalem? On this, there is a fascinating Midrash, which teaches us that Jerusalem, Yerushalayim, is a hybrid of two names which were given by two very different people. And we want to address this also this evening. Open up source number three right below the video in your PDF. There's a curriculum with sources, source number three. Zakta Medrash, Beresh, Shabbat, Parsha, Nunvav, Piske, Yud. It's on Parsha's Vayera. Discussing the story of the binding of Isaac, God tells Abraham to take his son and offer him on Mount Moriah. Lech lechol Eretz HaMariah. That's, of course, the place where the temple would be built one day in the city of Jerusalem. At the end of the story, Abraham gives the mountain and the section a name. Let's see the Medrash, source number three. Avram Kara Isayira. Avram, Abraham, our father, called Jerusalem by the name Yire. He shall see. Shenemar, the verse says clearly at the end of Ayer of Ayikra, Avram, Shem, Mamokim, Ahu, Hashem, Yire. Avram called the name of that place where he was ready to sacrifice his son Yitzchak, Isaac. Hashem, Yire, the place where God will see, observe, witness. Yire, he will see. Shem, there was another man. His name was Shem. Shem is, of course... Discussed in the portion of Noah, he's one of Noah's sons. Noah has three sons, Shem, Cham, and Yafes. Remember the names, Shem, Cham, and Yafes. You probably know the story. There was once a Hebrew school teacher 
was um, teaching the weekly portion to the students, and he was trying to explain to them that Noah had three sons, and the names of the three sons was Shem and Chum, were Shem and Chum and Yafas. One of the children was just not getting it. The names were just too strange for him, and he could not absorb the information. So finally the teacher says, Son, let me explain this to you with a very simple example. You live on a block, you have three friends on your block. One guy's name is Tim, and one guy's name is Billy, and one guy's name is Harry, or actually Tom, Dick, and Harry, right? So Noah had three sons. There's Tom, Dick, and Harry, and Noah had three sons, Shem, Cham, and Yafas. The boy comes home and his mother says, so what do you study today in school? He says, I learned that Noah had three sons. What were their names? Tom, Dick, and Harry. So Noah's son is Shem. Says the Madri is Shem, Kora, I say Shalom. Shem also gave Jerusalem a name. Shalem. The complete, complete, the complete one. Shenemar. Torah says in Vayero, Malki Tzedek Melech Shalem. Malki Tzedek, which was a title for shame, was Melech Shalem, was the city of Shalem, referring to Jerusalem. So he called Yerushalayim Shalem, the complete one. Amar HaKadosh Baruch Hu God said, if I will name Yerushalayim with the name of Yira, he will see as Abraham called it, Shem Adam Tzadik Misraim. Shem, who is a righteous man, will complain. Vim Kairani Yosei Shalem Avram Adam Tzadik Misraim. And if the name I give it is Shalem, the complete one, then Avram, who is a righteous man, will complain. El Areni Kairani Yosei Yerushalayim. Therefore, the name will be Yerushalayim Kamoshakaru Shnehem, as they both called it. Yira Shalem. Yeru Shalayim. I can't choose one name over the other. So I'm going to create a hybrid of both names. Yeru Shalayim. Yeru Shalayim, the first half of the name, is taken from Avram Avinu's name, Yira. And the final part of the name, Yeru Shalayim, Shalem, is taken from the name given by Shem, Shalem. Rashi there in the Medrash adds, Yeru Begematria Yira. Yud Reish Vav is the gematria, it's the numerology. Every letter in the Hebrew alphabet has a number. Yud Reish Vav, the first three letters of the name Yeru Shalayim, stands for 216. The same numerology as the word Yira he shall see, which is 216. Sixteen. But let's understand. What are the meaning of these? What is the meaning of these two names? Why did Avram choose the name Yiri? He will see. Why does Shame choose the word Shalom, the complete one? Why does God feel the need to create a hybrid between both names? Why? Because each of them are going to complain. Why will they complain? Why would Shame be so upset? If Avram Avinu gets the name, why would Avram be so upset if Shem gets the name? It's the name of a city. Why is it these two people who choose the name Yerushalayim? Why? But it's this, it's this hybrid of the two names, Yeru and Shalayim, Avram and Shem, which can begin to tell us the story about the difference between Noach and Avram. The two great personalities in the beginning of Genesis. Noach, who is saved from a devastating flood, builds an ark and is saved. And Avram Avinu becomes the founder of the Abrahamic Jewish faith, father of Am Yisrael, of the Jewish people. The reason, or one of the reasons, Rashi and the rabbis give us a disgraceful interpretation for the word of about Noyach, the question in the opening of the class, is precisely to answer this question, why was Noyach not chosen as the first Jew? And hence the answer is because in his generation he was a very righteous man. 
but compared to Avram's generation, he amounts to nothing. Why is Avram's generation chosen? Because this is the question that's perturbing us. Why was he versus, why was Avram versus Noah chosen as the first Jew? This is a great question. That's why the Torah says, Bidoy so you have to understand Noah was a great man in his generation. But relative to Avram Avinu, you can't compare the level of righteousness, the level of depth, the level of the relationship to God. Why? What was the difference? The Zohar, the foundational text of Kabbalah, opens, our, opens a window to understand both the greatness of Noah as well as the flaw or lack of Noah, what remains wanting in his life story. Source number four, Zogdeh Zoyar Noach, Tav Samach Zayin, Amit Bey 67b. The Zohar there contrasts Moshe Rabbeinu to Noach, Moses to Noach. He says, Kivan the Omar Luhu di Yishtiziv Hu Abonai, when Noach heard that he and his children will be saved from a flood, Leibor Racham and Alalm, he did not beg for compassion for the rest of the world. The Isavidu and civilization perished. The waters of the flood are called on his name, Kemodat Amrit. As the verse says in Yeshaya, Isaiah chapter 54 says, God says, The waters of Noah to me, I have made an oath that the waters of Noah shall not return. Now, this is a fascinating concept. The flood is defined in the book of Yeshaya, in the book of Isaiah, as the waters of Noach. Noach's flood, Noach's waters. But why? Why is it called his flood? It wasn't his flood. It was a flood that occurred in his generation. He was not guilty, on the contrary. He was the only righteous person, the only untarnished, uncorrupt person. You can call it Noach's ark. He built an ark and it saved him and his family and the animals that went into the ark. But why Noach's flood? It was his flood, it was his generation's flood. Comes the Zohar and says that the reason the prophet Yeshaya calls the flood May Noyach, the waters of Noyach, it's because somehow he shears part of the guilt, part of the responsibility, part of the devastation of the flood. Why? Because he did not worry about the world. He did not think about the world. He did not pray, beg, beseech God to save the world. Unlike Moses, as the Zohar there continues at length, you can look it up in the Zohar, in the sources I just quoted a few lines. Unlike Moses, who also hears from God, after the Jews create a golden calf, I will annihilate them and I will save you. And Moses says, Oh no. If you don't forgive them, delete me from the book that you have written. Moshe does not tolerate that possibility that he will be saved at the expense of the world. But why? Why did Noach not pray? Why did Noach not feel responsible for his generation? Why did Noach not reach out to his generation? Pray for them, fight for them, work with them. The Zohar, a little later, gives us an answer. We have it in source number five. Says the Zohar, Noyach, Omer Rabbi Yehuda, the Zohar there brings different perspectives, but here's the perspective of Rabbi Yehuda, Rabbi Judah. Rabbi Judah says, My Avalei Lamevet. What did you want Noach to do? He couldn't do anything. Elevadei Noach dochil al garmehav. Noach was scared for himself. Begin the lawyer, Rabbi Moise, begoy chayavi alma. He was scared not to die among those who were guilty in the world. What the Zohar is suggesting is, although it's very brief, Noah was scared to deal with the world. He was scared to have a connection with the world. He didn't want a relationship with the people around him. He was scared that he was afraid. He was afraid that he will perish with them. He will go down with them, and hence he isolated himself. What does this mean? What is the Zohar telling us? It's here that we can begin to understand the philosophy behind Noah's life, behind Noah's behavior. And I'm going to introduce it through what would seem as a far-fetched law, but in Torah, everything is interconnected and integrated. Please open up source number five. We're going to learn a piece of Talmud about Hanukkah. 
Mesech the Shabbos, Dav Chaf Aleph, Amit um, Beis Tractate Shabbos 21, Bizag de Gemara, source number six. Source number six in your curriculums below the village. Toda Rabban and the rabbis learned, Ne'er Chanukah, the Chanukah light, the Chanukah lamp, mitzvah la nichal, Pesach Beisim ebechutz. The mitzvah is to place it outside the door of your home. The Imdahar Yadar Bali, what if the person lived on an attic, on a second floor, on the higher floor? So he can't put it on the door of his home going outside because he doesn't have such a door going outside. To the, to the yard, what should he do? He places the candelabra of Hanukkah, the menorah, at the window that faces the public thoroughfare. In a time of danger, as Rashi and the commentators explain, it was sometimes dangerous to light a menorah at the window because Jews were not allowed to light menorahs at certain dates, at certain occasions. Then Manichal Shulchanoi Vedayoi, he can place the menorah on his table in his house and he fulfills or she fulfills the mitzvah even though it's not outside and even though it's not in the window. We know an axiom that every law, every mitzvah in Torah, in addition to its physical interpretation, it also has a psychological, emotional, and spiritual counterpart and interpretation. And I want to share with you one interpretation that's presented by some of the Hasidic masters. This particular one is a combination of a beautiful explanation presented by the holy Koznitz and Magad Bistral of Koznitz in his book Avoidus Yisrael on Hanukkah, as well as by the Lubavitcher Rebbe in one of his Rishimus in one of his private journals concerning Hanukkah. And what the explanation is, we know that the light of Hanukkah represents the light of Torah. King Solomon writes in Proverbs, Ki ne'er mitzvah v'tayra'er. A mitzvah is a lamp and Torah represents light. So the light of the menorah is symbolic. It represents the light, the warmth, the passion, and the depth of Torah. Comes the halacha and says, The light of Torah, the light of mitzvahs, you can't hold on to it and retain it within your own home, within your own four cubits, within your own life. Rather, you have to place it on the door of your home, outside of the door of your home. You want to illuminate the street. You want to illuminate the world. You want to illuminate other people. You want to reach out, inspire people, kindle sparks, embrace souls, bring the light of Hanukkah to other people, bring the light of Torah the meaning of Torah, the value system of Torah, the depth and the love of Torah to others, to those who are outside. But what about if you're living on an aliyah, you're living on an attic, you're living on a higher floor? This is symbolic of people who are removed from society. There are people that are aloof. They're sublime. Edel, I mentioned, very fine people. They're not out there mingling with other people. They're really naturally or through work. They're aloof. They're spiritualists. Transcendent, transcendental types of people. higher souls. Let them think. The Talmud says, Ra'isi bnei aliyah ve'em watim. Pshimem Bayechai says in the Talmud, Ra'isi bnei aliyah. I saw people who were bnei aliyah. Bnei aliyah means people of great stature. People of a great elevated level, like an aliyah, you live on a higher level, on an attic, on a roof, above the rest of society. There are a few people like that, not many, but there are bnei aliyah, very sensitive souls. Lest the ben aliyah think, ah, I can completely detach myself. I can live only for myself, says the Talmud, no. Even he must put the manayr at the window. Even he or she is responsible to inspire another person, to share the light with another person, to reach out to another heart, to give somebody else love and warmth and depth and passion and truth. Yes, they may not have to go outside, but at least by the window, so that other people should also be able to benefit and become more aglow from the light. Sometimes it's a time of danger. Sometimes it's dangerous to go out. Sometimes if you go out, 
to influence others. Instead of you influencing them positively, they may influence you negatively. Because in order to impact people positively, you have to have a spine. You have to have strength of character. You have to know who you are. You have to have courage. You must be a holistic person. You can't be ambivalent. You can't be fragmented, split, and doubt. And sometimes if you go outside of your home, or if you even go to the window, the danger is that the interaction may influence you negatively rather than allow you to influence other people positively. We know that you put sometimes people in new environments, especially youngsters, their friends, their social life has a tremendous impact on them. They can influence their friends, their colleagues positively, but sometimes it can also be the other way around. There's the famous example that they told us Yaakov Yosef, Rabbi Yaakov Yosef of Pulna, the great pupil and student of the Baal Shem Tov, writes in Parshas Baha Aloyscha, in the name of his teacher, in the name of the Baal Shem Tov, whose 250th yard site we commemorate this year, the Baal Shem Tov gave an example of a person who's drowning, and you go out to save them. If you were not trained to save a person who's drowning and you're not strong, we know what can happen, God forbid. Instead of you having the ability to schlep him out of the water, what can happen is often the person who's drowning can pull the person who came to save him down and they'll both die. So when you're going out deep into the water to save somebody who's drowning, you have to have the strength to be able to lift them up. And if not, it's Bashas Hasakon, it's a time of danger. Then what may happen is you too might go down. ambulance is on a call to go save somebody and bring them to the hospital on the way the driver of the ambulance sees that he's on empty there's no gas to continue so his neighbor in the passenger seat says we don't have time to go fill up on gas we have to go save lives that's a very foolish argument of course you have to go save lives but if you don't have gas you will not be able to save lives of course you have to save lives, but if you don't have gas, if you don't have the inner fuel, the inner inspiration, you will not have the energy with which to go save them. You must fill up on gas in order you should be able to save lives. Sometimes it's a time of danger outside. And if you go out to bring the menorah outside, you may have your light extinguished rather than lighting up others. Then, put it on your table. Then you must create a cocoon. You must create a corner, an oasis of light, of spirituality, of holiness, within your own four cubits, and that's enough. This was Noyach's philosophy. Noyach says, it's Shas HaSakona. It's a time of danger. You want me to take my menorah and open my door and illuminate the outside? You want me even to place my menorah by my window? I can't! If I do so, I will subject myself, my wife, my children, and my entire family to moral decay, to moral degeneration, to a depraved reality, to a society that has stripped itself from every vestige of dignity, of righteousness, of justiceness, of morality of goodness, of kindness. I can't deal with the world. Noyach's philosophy was I must put a menorah on my table. Let it at least warm my own home. Let it warm myself. Let it warm my children. You want me to reach out to the world. You want me to speak to people. You want me to pray for people. You want me to think about them, to worry about them. I can't. It's dangerous. My menorah must stay inside on my table. This is what the Zohar probably means. He was scared for himself. Dachil al garmei, in the words of the Zohar that I quoted before in source number five. Dachil al garmei, he was scared for himself. And hence the same told us Yaakov Yosef, or Yaakov Yosef of Pumla, the student of the Baal Shem Tev, in his book Ben Peris Yosef. Explains the words in the opening of Noyach Hasalakim Hisalach Noyach. Noyach walked with God. What does it mean, Noyach walked with God? He walked with God, he didn't walk with people. 
Noach was an isolationist. Noach was an isolated figure who lived in a cocoon of holiness, of spirituality, of morality, of justice. He lived with God. He walked with God. This was the story of Noach. Avram Avinu was very different. Avram Avinu understood that the ultimate calling of human existence is not to place the menorah on your table and let it illuminate your home, but to take the menorah and put it out the window. And not just out the window, to open up your door al Pesach Beisim Ibachutz and illuminate the entire world with the presence of a living God, with the call to decency, to kindness, to unity, and to morality, to responsibility. Avram Avinu understood as the opening of Lech Lecha reads, look at source number 7, where the Torah describes source number 7, the souls that Abraham and Sarah, his wife, made in Chor and Zokrashi, Sheikh Nisan Tachas Kanfei Ashkino. Avraham brought souls under the wings of God. Avraham, Megayeris, Hanoshim, Vesorim, Megayeris, Hanoshim. Avraham Avinu brought in the men, Sarah, his wife, brought in the woman. woman. When God wants to describe the greatness of Abraham, why he loves him so, look, take a look at source number eight. What does he say about Avram? Avram, Abraham will be a great nation, and all the nations will be blessed from him. For I love him. Because Avram Avinu, I know will instruct his children and will instruct his entire family after him to preserve the way of God, to do righteousness and justice. What do I know about Avram Avinu? Not just that he himself is great and righteous and holy, but his children in his home that after him, generations after him, they'll preserve his legacy and his faith and pass it on from generation to generation. Source number nine, the famous Gemara Masech Tesoite Daf Yud on the verse in Vayei Revayikri Sham B'Shem Hashem Keloylam. Avram Avinu called down in the name of God, the God of the world. Amar Eish Lakish, Eish Lakish said, Al Tikri Vayikri Ele Vayakri. A Torah doesn't have vowels. So you can read Vayikri, he called out. You can also read the same letters as Vayakri. He made other people call out. Malamed, this teaches us. Avram Avinu impacted every person who came by his tent and caused him or her to call out in the name of God. This was the uniqueness of Avram Avinu. Avram Avinu understood that his calling was not just to put a manure on his table, but to illuminate the world. Um al as we say in the prayers of Rosh Hashanah, V'yeda kol pol kiyata piyalta. Let every creature know that you created him. Let everyone who has a soul in his nostrils say, God is king and his kingdom, his sovereignty permeates the entire world. Avram Avinu understood his unique calling is not just to preserve the menorah for himself, but rather to go out to the entire world, that the entire world should be saturated with the truth that there is a Siddhah Gattav, the veil that God exists in the world. Avram Avinu some people say and have written, Arabina was the founder of ethical monotheism, which means the ethical system based on the idea that there's one God. If there's one God, it means that the entire world is united. It means that the world is one. It means that all of humanity is connected. It means that we are integrated in a very profound way because we all come from one creator. 
and there is one purpose that defines the world. So there is a unity in the world. So people attribute ethical monotheism to Avram Avinu. Avram Avinu founded ethical monotheism, but that's not the case. Avram Avinu was not the first man of faith. He was not the first monotheist. He was not the first ethicist. He was not the first person who lived by a very uh, powerful moral code based on a moral and just God who asks people to be kind to each other and to realize that they have a responsibility in the world to make the world a good place, a holy place, a divine place. Avram Avinu was not the first person to do that. There were many people in Avram's generation and in earlier generations who embraced the code of ethical monotheism. Noah, for example. Noah had a son, Shem. Shem was a great man. There was a great man named Hanoich. There was a great man named Mesushalach. These were all great ethical human beings, holy people, dedicated people, men of deep faith, of deep spirituality, of deep holiness, of great stature, and of great moral sensitivity. Let's take the personality of Shem, the son of Noach. We know that Shem had a yeshiva. There was a yeshiva where people came to learn about the truths that Judaism would expound upon. The truths of God, the truths of a soul, the truths of monotheism, of ethics, of values. Take a look in source 10, the Zohar Chadash, and Noach says, Abraham came to learn in the yeshiva in the academy of shame, the son of Noach. It's not just true about Abraham. How about Rebecca? Source number 10, next source, next source. Rashi and Teldus, Rebecca is pregnant, Rivka is pregnant. Her pregnancy is tumultuous. Vatelech Lidrish says Hashem, she goes to ask God, who did Rebecca go to? Lebeis Medrash shall shame. She went to the Beis Medrash, to the Yeshiva of shame. So now we have the third generation, Yaakov. Take a look at the next source, the famous Rashi and Teldus, V'yakov Ishtam Yoshev Aholam. Jacob was a wholesome man who sat in tents. Which tents? Zakt Rashi, all I shall shame, all I shall ever. Jacob studied in the tent in the yeshiva of shame and the yeshiva of Aver. Later also when Jacob would run away from his brother Esau, for 14 years he would spend time in the yeshiva of shame studying Torah. So let's understand this. Shame, the son of Noah, has a major yeshiva to the extent that Avram Avinu, the first Jew, studies there. Rebecca, Yitzchak's wife, studies there. Yaakov studies there for many, many years, more than a decade probably more than two decades because in his youth he also studied there. But none of them become the first Jews. Not Shem, not Noyach, not Chanoich, not Mesushalach. Even though Shem has a yeshiva where Avram and Yaakov and Rivka come to study and seek the truth of God, no one would become a first Jew till Avram. Why not? The answer is extremely important. Shame, Chanoich, Mesushalach, they all had what we would call in Yiddish, Shtiblach. They all had cocoons of spirituality, cocoons of monotheism, little circles where great people would come and study and meditate and pray and learn. And in the privacy and intimacy of their societies, of their cloistered societies and environments and yeshivas, they preached the doctrines that they received all the way back from the first people who were created by God, Adam and Eve. Avram Avinu was the first one who took the menorah and went outside. Avram Avinu is the first one who would call press conferences about Judaism. Avram Avinu understood that you can be secure with your product to go out to the entire world. The Rambam describes in the laws of Avedazar in chapter 1 how Avram would go from city to city and lecture and speak. Rabbeinu Menachem Hameiri in his introduction to Perkeyavis claims that Avram Avinu can transform almost half of human civilization of his time. Avram Avinu suddenly went to the media. Avram Avinu suddenly went to the outside world. Avram Avinu turned it from an inner experience to something that was right there outside for everybody to see, for everybody to experience. How? Why? Avram understood two things. Number one, 
You have the real product and you don't have to be ashamed with it. Don't be embarrassed. Don't be ashamed. God is the truth of reality. Let humanity know who it really is. And number two, Avraham Avinu understood that this is what the world is really thirsty for. Humanity has a soul and it's craving to connect to itself. It's craving to realign itself with its own truth, with its own source, with its own reality. It's sick and tired of living. A life of shallowness and emptiness. A circular life which goes nowhere. The world wants to connect to God. Avram Avinu understood these two things and therefore he said, let's go out. And suddenly there were press conferences. Suddenly there were large lectures. Suddenly there were conversations in the streets. Suddenly there were write-ups in the newspapers and on websites and on blogs. Suddenly it was the conversation. Suddenly Avram Avinu's name became known. All of those great monotheists who were in the shtibel eating herring and sponge cake and singing songs and connecting with themselves looked and said, wow, wow. We don't have to have, do it in a basement. We don't have to keep it on our table. We can put it by the window. We can go al Pesach Beisim Ibechutz. And everyone emerged. And this is where Judaism begins. In the responsibility and in the calling, not just to be holy yourself, but to make an impact on other people, to illuminate the world, the Jewish world and the entire world. This is where Avram Avinu Uniqueness begins. Shame, like his father Noyach. He was a great man. Had a yeshiva. Avram went to the yeshiva. But it was an isolated place. It was a hidden place. So when he now gives a name to Yerushalayim, what's the name he chooses? Shalim. Complete. Wholesome. That's the ethos of shame. You must reach Shlemus. You want to work on your own perfection, on your own spirituality, on your own growth. This is a great idea. Shalem. When he wants to address what is Yerushalayim, Yerushalayim would become the home of God. It would become the center of spirituality. It would become the spiritual nervous system from where divine energy would flow to the entire world. So Shem says, what's the proper name for Yerushalayim? What's the proper approach to touch the place where God would choose as His abode, Shalem. Work on your Shlemos, work on your completion. Avram Avinu chooses a different name. Avram Avinu's name is Hashem Yira. God will see. Yira. You must be able to open your eyes and see what's happening outside. You must be able to open your eyes and experience what is happening to the people and to the world around you. You can't just lock yourself up in your own four cubits and work on your own perfection. Yira! You must be able to see, you must be able to identify, you must be able to feel. Umal chusoi bakoil mashal and bring the warmth and the truth of godliness to a world outside of you. And as the Medrash there says, concerning Yerushalayim, why did Avram say, Hashem, you God will see? Because Abraham said, one day the Jewish people might be very flawed. Hashem, Yira, God should see what happened on this mountain, what I was ready to do with my child. Let him see and eternally forgive his people. Unlike Noah, who worried about himself, Abraham names Yerushalayim Yira. God shall see and be able to forgive. Abraham is worried about those who might be spiritually inferior. God now wants to give it the name. He synthesizes both names. Yira Shalom. Both. So the Yifetayar asks in Medrash, Shem was older than Abraham. It should have been Shalem Yeru, 
not Yerushalayim for shame than Avram. So the Yefei Tayar says because Avram was a greater tzaddik than shame. But the answer is really deeper. It's this name that captures the truth. Of course, shame has a very important message. A person must strive and work on themselves continuously. I have to challenge myself and work on myself and refine myself. But the name is Yerushalayim, Yerushalayim, first Avram and then Shem. Because it's precisely by reaching out to another person, it's precisely by inspiring another person that I too will reach my own perfection, that I too will become a holier person, that I too will become a better person. By being an ambassador of love and of light and of hope, I too will discover my own light. By Yira, I too will become Shalom. Hence the hybrid of the two names of Ramavino and Nayach. There is a uh, lovely introduction that was written to Shalos Achuvas Chasam Soifer Yeridea. The Chasam Sofer was one of the great rabbinic personalities of the early 1900s, late 1800s. The chief rabbi of Pressburg, today it's Bratislava. His name was Rabbi Moshe Sofer. Pressburg, Bratislava was under the Austrian-Hungarian Empire, and he was one of its great rabbinic figures, and his responsa, his answers to questions that were sent to him were published in a set known as Shailis or Chuvis Chasam Seifer. And in the introduction to the section on Yeridea, one of the sections of the Code of the Jewish Law, there's an introduction by his son, Rabbi Shimon Seifer, who was the rabbi of Krakow in Poland. It's an extraordinary introduction. But there's one piece over there where he dedicate, dedicates a section to discuss the uniqueness of Avram Avinu in this context. And those who have access to it, I would recommend you to read it because it's unique, because the Chassam Seifer himself, in the great dispute of his generation between the reformers of Judaism, the Chassam Seifer believed in Shitas Ha'iz Badlus and separation. Bishas HaSakon, he believed the time of danger, you have to put the manure on the table. And yet in that introduction, his son quotes him about the ultimate philosophy and perspective of Judaism. An extremely rich, rich piece where he says, Avram Avinu could have been like Chanoich. Chanoich melted away in ecstasy and spirituality to God. But Avram Avinu understood that what is the calling of a Jew? The calling of a Jew is to change the world. And the Chassam Seifer explains if the objective of the Jew is just to remain holy, God has millions and millions and myriads and myriads of angels who scream all day, Kaddish, 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 holy, holy, holy. If the objective why you came down to this world was simply to light a menorah on your table and experience the glow of the fire on the table, for this he has endless angels to be holy. The reason he sent his soul down to the world is to transform the world. And the reason he sent his soul down into the world is that the entire world should place its mouth in the mouth of man and scream, that call Paul, that every person and that every Jew should become inspired and infused with the light of godliness, with the light of holiness, with the light of Torah, with the light of Yiddishkeit. This is what Avraham Avinu understood. And therefore he came to Choron Ves HaNefesh HaShed he right away went out of himself and reached out to other people. And that way he reached into himself. And it's fascinating that all of these words, this message comes from the Chassam Seifer, as I said. The great Hungarian rabbi who felt in many ways the need for separation and yet explains here the greatness of Avraham Avinu. Similar sentiments were expressed by the Chafetz Chaim. The great Chafetz Chaim who, from the, who passed away in the 1930s, 1933, Rabbi Yisrael Meir Akoyen Kagan from Radin, known for his work, the Chafetz Chaim, the author of Mishnah Brura, Shmir Haloshin, and other works. And in his famous uh, pamphlet or booklet on Chizuk Choymas Hadas, strengthening the walls of religion, he expresses literally the same idea, although in different words, like the Chsam Seifer, why shame and Noyach were not chosen to be the first Jews because they served God for themselves, they became perfect people. Avraham Avinu understood that his job is to change the world, his job is to illuminate the world. I 
think that this is extremely important for us also to understand in this generation. Somebody asked me the other day, he said, how would you define the contribution, the unique contribution of the Lubavitcher Rebbe to American Jewry? Is it true that the Rebbe reinvented Judaism in the United States of America or other communities? I said, no, that's not the case. American Jewry had great Jews there were rebbes, and there were rabbis, and there were gdoilim who had shtiblach. They had beautiful synagogues and shtiblach and some yeshivas where they sang and they studied and they taught and they inspired and they were inspired. Just like Chanoich and Mesushalach and Shem and Noyach. But they all built an ark built a teva. Teva means a word. The Baal Shem Tov says teva means word. And they went into the ark. Why did they go into the ark? Because there was a flood. And if there's a flood and you don't stay in the ark, you can drown. Just like Hanukkah, when there's a danger, you can't put the menorah by the window. You have to go inside. You have to stay in the teva. They all built an ark just like Noyach to save themselves from the flood. The Lubavitcher Rebbe didn't invent Judaism in America. But he was the Avram Avinu in America. was the first one to say this is the real message go out to the entire world with it and go out to every single Jew with it this is what they're thirsting for this is what they're yearning for and this is the truth of the real world of reality this was the language he spoke and it's interesting one of the great <laughs> and famous campaigns of the Rebbe was to put Menorahs publicly why? It wasn't just the menorah. It was symbolic of a whole Weltanschauung, of a whole approach. What is a Jew? And what is the calling of a Jew? And what is the potential of a Jew? And what is the ultimate message of Judaism? This is what it represented. And suddenly, what happened was, all the shames, all the chanoiks, all the misoshelachs, all the noyachs, potential. They realized the calling. They realized the future. The Rebbe turned Judaism from inside towards outside. Inside out. Shalem you need, but don't ignore the era. And everyone began to build and expand and reach out each in their own way. And today we observed a renaissance, a rejuvenation, a rebirth. Thank God of so many different types of communities and Jews from so many different backgrounds and walks of life and perspectives all reinvented themselves. And understood, you can go out of the TV, you can go out of the ark. Noyach was sent into an ark because his whole life he was in an ark. His whole life he was in a teva. He saved. How was he saved? Through isolation. Avram Avinu said, I also want to be saved. But I know that the whole world wants to be saved. So I have to go out to the world. And thus in conclusion they say, one of the great masters said, and I heard it a few times from the Rebbe, from the Lubavitcher Rebbe himself, when it's very cold outside, you can do one of two things. You could put on a pelt, a fur coat, and you'll be very, very warm. Or you can light a fire. The difference, when you put on a fur coat, you will remain warm. But everyone around you will remain cold. When you light a fire, you will be warmed, and all the people around you will be warmed. Thank you.